All right, welcome everyone. Um, it is a little after two or a little after one. Um, and in the interest of um, everyone's time, we'll go ahead and get started. Um, thank you for joining us today for the second installment of a three-part series on navigating probation and parole. Today's topic is referrals and evidence-based practices. Uh, my name is Heather Doncaster and I'm the Chief of Planning, Research and Reentry. I will be the moderator for today's session. Uh, for those of you who aren't aware, Planning, Research and Reentry is a specialized unit in the Office of the Commissioner that oversees and coordinates prisoner reentry initiatives, leads the department's data and collection analysis efforts, facilitates strategic planning, oversees accreditation and compliance, and provides project and grant management for multi-bureau initiatives. Today's presenters are regional managers, um, Jeff Boykin and Keisha Winchester. Probation and Parole Director, Melissa Kearney, also joins us today. And I believe um, Director Kearney is going to introduce our presenters. That is correct. Thanks, Heather. <laughs> Good afternoon, everyone. So I want to take the time to thank you for attending today and to introduce two members of my leadership team um, who are going to be the primary presenters today. Um, the first is Jeff Boykin. He is the uh, regional manager of the Harris Corner office. So I'm going to just give you a little bit of um, biographical information. So Jeff joined the DOC in 1998 and graduated from our basic officers class in 1999. Manager Boykin worked at the Harris Corner office, the Cherry Lane office, and formerly the Pine Street office. He completed a rotation in um, serving in various roles um, as an officer in institutional release, level two, level three. I adapt re-entry. He was promoted to supervisor in 2011. Uh, he became the operations administrator of the Harris Corner office in 2019 and was promoted to regional manager um, in 2020. So that's his current position. Um, he, he also serves as the American Correctional Association or ACA accreditation manager and is the EPICS training coordinator for probation and parole. He served as a DAX administrator, which is our, our um, computer system since 2011. And he is a 2016 graduate of the Delaware State Police Leadership Development and holds a bachelor's degree in criminal justice from the University of Delaware. Also, we have Keisha Winchester. Uh, she is currently the regional manager of our Dover office. Keisha has worked in various positions throughout her 27 year career with the department. She started her career as a DOC correctional counselor at BWCI in 1996. She became a probation and parole officer in 1998 and rose to the ranks of probation supervisor before becoming a planner five for the Office of Planning, Research and Reentry. In 2020, she returned to PNP to serve her current role as regional manager of Kent County. Manager Winchester is a 2021 graduate of the DSP Leadership Program and holds a bachelor's degree in information systems and a master's degree in management and management information of systems from Wilmington University. Through her, throughout her career, Keisha has worked with individuals under supervision, community partners, and state and federal agencies to champion, champion building stronger individuals and communities. So thank you. Um, and I'm going to turn it over to the presenters. All right, thanks so much, Missy. Um, today's agenda, uh, before we um, get fully started, um, just some highlights, today's agenda is going to include information on referrals to community-based services and the use of evidence-based practices in community supervision. We'll also give time, um, give some information um, about ways to get involved and connected. And at the end, we will have a period for um, uh, questions and answers. Throughout the webinar, please go ahead and submit any questions that you might have for our presenters in the Q&A box on your Zoom screen. Please use the Q&A box versus the um, chat screen um, to submit your questions. It's, it makes it easier for us to kind of keep track of them. Um, at the end, I'll select some questions that have been submitted through Q&A and pose them to our presenters. We might not be able to get to all of the um, questions that are posed depending on timing. So just keep in mind um, that if we aren't able to answer your question um, during the webinar, if you would like us to um, get back to you after, uh, after the webinar, you just need to ask your question um, 
using your name, you can't uh, don't ask it anonymously if you want us to be able to follow up with you. We also aren't able to answer um, questions about specific individuals um, or their experiences during the course of the webinar, but we will um, give information about um, how you can get in contact with people who uh, can answer those questions. Or again, as long as you don't answer your, ask your question anonymously, we can get in, in touch with you after the webinar um, in order to answer some of those questions. Um, the webinar uh, will be recorded and it will be posted to the department's YouTube channel. We will also make the PowerPoint available um, to everyone after the webinar, and we will supply certificates of attendance for those who stay tuned, who stay tuned um, for the entirety of the webinar. You can also view all of our previous um, uh, webinars um, on the department's YouTube channel. We'll also do some polls during the course of the webinar today to keep things interactive. Um, we do ask all of our poll questions anonymously, so please, um, you know, feel comfortable answering, um, you know, guessing if you aren't sure of the answer, go ahead and take a guess. We don't know who's, who's answering, um, and your feedback is important to us. So I'm going to go ahead and launch the first poll, um, just to get a sense of who is joining us today. Um, so hopefully it is launching on your screen right now. Um, and it just is going to ask everyone to weigh in as to what stakeholder group best describes you. Um, DOC employees, state employees, nonprofit organization, um, employees or volunteers, community members and advocates, students uh, for profit human services. If you scroll down, there's other ones on there, legal, media, legislators, others. So I'll just give another um, few seconds or so. Thank you for people who are um, weighing in and we'll share the responses just to show everyone kind of who we have in the audience today joining us. All right, if anybody else wants to give a quick response, I'll go ahead and end the poll in three, two, one. All right, and I will uh, share results. Uh, looks like we have a lot of um, DOC employees joining us today, which is nice. I think we always have a lot of um, staff members who, who join our webinars, um, people who work for various um, parts of the agency come to learn about um, what their coworkers do. We have other state agency employees, uh, people from the nonprofit sector, for profit, um, some people from the legal field, and a couple of people who we didn't quite find a um, uh, a bucket that they fit in. So a couple of people who who are in the other bucket. So again, thanks everyone um, for joining us. All right, so let's see. Our next slide um, is shows the location of the probation and parole district offices um, throughout the state. Um, we have uh, one in each of, in each county, two in Newcastle County, and then one in, oh, well, let me do this again. Two in Newcastle County, one in Kent County, and two in Sussex County. You can also find this information on the department's website um, at doc.delaware.gov. And now, I believe I'm going to turn it over to Manager Winchester to talk to us about community-based referrals. So, Keisha, I turn it over to you. Okay. Thank you, um, Chief Dunpaster and Director Kearney. So, in part one of our Probation Insider Series, we discussed the indiv individualized assessments that identify the needs of individuals under supervision. After identifying needs by completing a probation intake assessment and a transition accountability plan, probation works with providers in each PNP office and community-based organizations to provide targeted support. This targeted support helps individuals under supervision take steps towards positive life changes and their ability to contribute to a safer community. Next slide, please. Okay, and before we move on to the next slide, I think you're going to tell us um, as we go on a little bit more about specific services and programs that um, uh, probation and parole partners with. So before we do that, I want to launch the next poll. So poll number two. Uh, question is, true or false, probation and parole does not offer any services or programming at probation and parole district offices. And again, remember your answer is anonymous. So even if you aren't 100% sure, go ahead and take a guess. Okay. 
we have a lot of people weighing in. I appreciate the participation. We'll give it another second or two, and then I will close the poll in three, two, one. All right, so let's see. Manager Winchester, it seems that 91% of people who are participating today um, believe that it is false. Probation and parole does offer services and programming at the probation and parole district offices. Is that the correct answer? That is correct, and that's good to hear. All right, and I'll turn it back. Okay. So probation works with in-house providers who deliver services at each district office to reduce service barriers. Our in-house providers conduct evaluations and provide treatment for substance use disorder, domestic violence, and for those that sexually offend. Our in-house providers make fulfilling the court order obligations easier since treatment and probation visits can be scheduled on the same day. Our providers include Brandywine Counseling and Community Services for Substance Use Disorder, Vital Core, our partner for the Road to Recovery Program, People's Place for Domestic Violence Anger Management Treatment, Progressions for Sex Offender Treatment, and the Delaware Center for Justice, which offers life skills, housing assistance, job readiness, and job search. Each district office partners with other community providers to offer, as needed, less formal services. Each office provides classroom or lobby space for partners to come in and provide services such as peer support, life skills, job readiness, and veterans assistance, to name a few. We also invite mobile wellness and behavioral health vans, such as AmeriHealth and Net Counseling, to use our parking lots to offer services to clients. For individuals in need of a higher level of care, such as IOP for substance use disorder or mental health treatment, Probation uses the Delaware Treatment and Referral Network, which is a statewide comprehensive network for behavioral health and substance use disorder treatment. Probation continuously builds relationships with providers to meet various individual needs. While some, offer, while some services are offered at no cost, others are based on a sliding fee scale, are covered by individual health insurance, or could be offered or covered by DSAM services for uninsured or the underinsured. Building community and community outreach are essential to us. Some community events we continuously host include job fairs, food distribution, health and wellness outreach, and clothing distribution. Each district office strives to meet immediate needs by maintaining clothing and toiletry closets and food banks. We also support our communities and community partners by participating, participating in community resource and school fairs. Thank you. All right, great, Keisha, thank you so much. Um, now, I think we're gonna move to, I'll turn it over to manager Boykin who's gonna to talk to us about evidence-based practices in community supervision, otherwise known as EPICS. Jeff. Good afternoon. Um, I'm gonna to talk to you guys a little bit about EPICS. Uh, EPICS was developed by the University of Cincinnati Corrections Institute based on decades of research in the field of corrections and core correctional practices. Uh, the purpose of EPICS is to change the thoughts, attitudes, and feelings of the individuals we supervise in order to promote pro-social behavior, uh, with the overall goal being to reduce recidivism. Uh, the model strives to fully utilize the time that we spend with the people we supervise and can give them consistent and structured messaging throughout the course of their supervision term. Uh, it's not intended to replace more intensive treatments. For example, uh, if somebody is in need of substance abuse treatment or domestic violence treatment or perhaps sex offender treatment, uh, EPIX is not designed to replace those methods of treatment. EPIX adheres to the principles of effective intervention. Um, there's four principles, risk, need, responsivity, and fidelity. Uh, when we're talking about the risk need, we're talking about who, who are we dealing with? EPIX is designed to be delivered to high-risk individuals. It's not designed uh, to be used with lower risk individuals who are otherwise in compliance. 
um, need, what are we addressing? We're targeting criminogenic needs in order to reduce recidivism. Those are things like drug use, family marital issues, uh, peer interactions. Uh, we wanna make sure when we're practicing ethics that we're targeting a criminogenic need. Uh, responsivity is the, ha or uh, in other words, how. Uh, we're gonna use cognitive behavioral therapy based approaches and we're gonna individualize it to each client. And then fidelity, we're talking about how well. Uh, when we're talking about using EPICS, um, it's only gonna be as good if we use it as it's designed. So when we're talking about fidelity, we wanna make sure we're using the model as closely as we were trained to use it. Uh, this is how EPIC sessions are structured. Uh, there's four steps. There's a check-in, a review, an intervention, and then a homework. So basically, this is the structure that we follow with each office visit um, when we're conducting our interviews. So during the check-in period, um, that's when you're building rapport, you're assessing for compliance and needs. During the review stage, that's where you're reviewing goals or prior sessions that you may have had and discussing any type of referrals. Uh, the intervention, this is where you would specifically target a criminogenic need using an intervention that we've been trained on. And then homework. Uh, during this phase, we would encourage people to use the new skills that they've learned, or uh, it could be something as simple as assigning them a, a task to complete for next time. And then I believe we have a short video to show here. Officer Keen, please call the Is the video playing? It is not. <laughs> okay. so, all right, sorry. Hold on. Somebody got to mention that. Give me one second. All right, I'll let you All right, so let's see. Um, share, share. Do we see a video now? Yes. Material to me compared to other law enforcement, and today, probation. I don't think we can hear it. Yeah, we don't hear the volume. Yeah. So we can't hear it. We can't hear the video. Correct. We can't hear the video. Yeah, I even practiced this earlier and it worked. All right. So I guess we'll have to just move on from the video. It was a good video. That the training is um Share. Share. All right. Do we have the PowerPoint back? Yes. Yeah. Okay. All right. So we will. I'm sorry. I, you know, I, I, I practiced the video and I don't know why it didn't work this time, but we'll add it to, um, we'll add it to the, uh, YouTube channel. Um, when, if you view it, um, It'll be embedded when we send the PowerPoint and we'll add it so that you can see it uh, later. So these are some of the core skills that we use with EPICS. Uh, on the left, we have relationship skills and behavior modification skills. These are things that we use throughout the model, uh, such as listening, giving feedback, uh, reinforcement, disapproval. 
And then the motivational skills and the cognitive behavioral skills, those are the intervention-based uh, techniques that we would use uh, during the visits. Uh, a cost-benefit analysis is, is simply like a, a pros and cons exercise that we would do. Uh, cognitive restructuring and pro-social modeling are, are getting into looking at thoughts and feelings. Uh, structured skill building is when we actually sit down and uh, develop a skill with an individual. And then problem solving is when we actually sit down and we teach concrete steps to solve a problem. Uh, these are concrete proven skills that probation officers can use. And many studies have shown that the use of these practices produces positive results. Uh, training. Uh, so this is an intensive training. Uh, it's, it's, it's one of the more difficult trainings that we've undergone since I've been with the department. Uh, there's an initial three-day classroom portion for officers and supervisors that covers the risk, need, res responsivity, core correctional practices, and all attendances required. Uh, and then we enter a five-month coaching session. Uh, during the coaching session, uh, the officers and trainees are submitting audio tapes that are being coded and they're receiving feedback on the, how they're doing with the model. And they also attend monthly coaching sessions uh, with the instructors to get additional feedback and additional training. So it's about a six month process to get fully trained in the use of this tool. Uh, the department started uh, this process back in 2018. Uh, when we started this process with the University of Cincinnati, they told us for an agency of our size, it would be about a five year plan to get our entire agency trained and about an eight year time frame to get the entire agency trained and to get this really entrenched in our day to day operations. Um, so it's really been a long term investment that we made uh, in this philosophy. And uh, as of May 2024, um, just about the entire agency will be trained. Um, this is just a graph basically showing that staff who are trained in EPICS um, are more like 30% more likely to use core correctional practices than staff who have not been trained. Uh, core correctional practices, like I've mentioned, have been shown um, to produce positive results, and those that are trained in EPICS are much more likely to use those practices. All right, so I think we figured out that it, the video is absolutely user error on my part. So if I don't mute myself uh, when I turn the video on, then you'll be able to hear it. So I'm gonna try it one more time. Uh, this is, do you see the video right now? Well, as we reported earlier this year, probation officers in Delaware have a lot more criteria to meet compared to other law enforcement. And today, probation officers with the Department of Correction added another training requirement to that list. Thursday, officers finished their third day of effective practices in community supervision training, also known as the EPICS program. Officials say the overall goal of the training is to help probation officers enhance public safety by helping to change the probationer's behavior so they don't commit additional crimes. They add that the training is vital for officers to take to make sure offenders thrive in their communities. With this training, we are able to help address the way folks are thinking and how they're going to conduct themselves after they're no longer under our supervision. And ultimately, if they're coming back into society, I think it's imperative that um, they're coming back out there with the skills and the tools necessary to function um, and make the best decisions on their own. Officials with the program say that they hope to make this EPICS training program mandatory for all probation officers across the first state within the next couple of years. All right. So there we go. I did it. Um, so now let me go back to the PowerPoint. And obviously that's a little, um, that's a little old, right? Because we, we have made it as uh, manager Boykin was um, telling everyone, you know, it is a, something that has rolled out um, to all staff statewide. Um, all right. Jeff, I will give it back to you now. Uh, 
All right. Uh, next, I think we're going to go into uh, our use of graduated responses and graduative incentives. Keisha, do you want to handle the incentives? Yes, I can take care of those. Okay. So an evidence-based practice is to incentivize individuals to enhance um, be positive behavioral change. And that is one of our goals. So as evidence has shown that reinforcement such as rewards is a reinforcing factor towards positive change, officers use graduated incentives to help affect that positive change. The next slide is a list of graduated incentives. Some ways individuals can earn incentives are by reporting timely to probation office visits, completing appointments for probation and treatment providers, reaching employment or education goals, or demonstrating positive change by being self-aware and self-motivated to change. Among other ways that individuals under supervision can earn incentives. The next slide is an indicator of how we've implemented graduated incentives throughout the last several years. And based on the numbers of graduated incentives through the end of February, 2024, we are paced to reach over 2,700 incentives being given to individuals under our supervision for the year of 2024. Great, thank you, Keisha. So we just learned about the use of graduated incentives. Uh, Probation Pro also uses graduated sanctions. So let's launch a poll now um, to see uh, what people's understandings of uh, graduated responses is before uh, we have manager Boykin talk some more about them. So uh, question is, what is the primary purpose of using graduated sanctions? Uh, a, to reinforce pro-social behavior, B, to reinforce a negative behavior, or C, to address, oh, I don't know if you can see the whole thing. I hope that you can on your screen. To uh, address non-compliance in lieu of submitting a violation uh, probation to the court. Thank you everyone for weighing in. We'll give it another few seconds. And I'll close the poll in uh, three, two, and one. And Jeff, so 60% uh, of our uh, participants believe that the primary use of graduated sanctions is to address non-compliance in lieu of submitting a violation to the court. Is that um, an accurate statement? Correct. Um, so just as, as we do address compliance, uh, unfortunately, we do have to address non-compliance as well. Uh, and we do that through the use of graduated sanctions. Um, these are sanctions that are done in the office at the office level without uh, contacting the court uh, with some exceptions. Uh, if there is a new arrest, uh, if there is risk to the community or an identified victim, or if a court order limits um, our discretion, those would be some exceptions where we cannot use the graduated sanction. Next slide. Uh, these are some examples. Can you back that up one? These are some examples of graduated sanctions that the officers are able to use. Uh, many of these sanctions are done between the officer and the individual on probation without any further involvement. Um, with the exception, I'll point out a couple to you. Uh, increase in supervision level. Uh, if we had somebody who was on a lower level of probation that we wanted to increase their supervision level, that would require approval of a supervisor and administrative commitment to level four. Uh, we do have the ability in-house to place somebody in a level four facility for a period of three days uh, without any involvement from the courts. Uh, if we want to do that, that actually requires uh, the approval of two supervisors. And finally, uh, there is one that requires the approval of a judge or sentencing authority if we were looking to add a condition to somebody's probation term, 
Um, for instance, if we were asking that they participate in some kind of programming or some kind of treatment and wanted to make that a part of their probation order, uh, we would need to contact the judge and get approval for them for that. But all the other ones, such as uh, verbal warnings, increased office visits, uh, increased treatment, all of that can be done between the officer and their client without any further involvement. And uh, here are some statistics on our non-compliance. Uh, as you can see, uh, last year we issued about 3,700 graduated sanctions. And really the significance of that is, you know, prior to coming up with this ability to issue sanctions, you know, that's a potentially 3,700 more violation reports that would have had to go out to a court or a sentencing order. So it really has reduced our uh, need to return people to the court and be able to handle those uh, behavior issues administratively. Okay, so I think that that um, kind of wraps up the um, uh, presentation portion of um, today's webinar. Thank you again to um, managers Wigan and Winchester for providing us with that information. Uh, we do want to provide you with um, some email addresses from different teams at DOC who can help with any questions that you might have. Um, for questions about specific individuals in custody or under supervision, you can contact the community relations team um, and they will assist you or refer you um, as appropriate. Uh, please, you know, just keep in mind that we cannot release certain personal or health related information on individuals without their permission. So if you are asking about a specific individual, the team may inquire about your relationship to that person and we'll need to make sure a proper um, release is on file. Uh, in addition to, um, we've also included uh, the victim services, um, contact information, the email box, and then the phone numbers for each of the victim service advocates in each county. And then the DOC reentry mailbox is here also. If you are looking for uh, additional ways to um, learn more about the Department of Correction or get involved, uh, we are still accepting applications for the DOC Youth Academy. Um, applications are being accepted until May 10th. Um, we have um, Youth Academy is available for um, folks age 10 to 17, uh, we break it up into two groups, kids age 10 to 13. Um, the academy will be held July 22nd to the 26th. And for the older folks, uh, the 14 to 17 year olds, July 22nd to the 29th. Uh, applications and information on the Youth Academy can be found on the department's website, um, on the community relations page, and additional information and videos from previous academies can be found on the department's socials. Uh, we also are hosting another uh, correctional officer hiring event on May 4th um, here at the Department of Correction Administration Building um, in Dover uh, from 8 a.m. to 1 p.m. Uh, Walk-ins are welcome. Uh, we do encourage people to apply um, in advance online, um, and you can find more information on that event on our website and on um, the department's socials. We invite you also to join us for um, the third and final installment of Navigating Probation and Parole Part 3, um, titled Ending Supervision. Um, we will have a date announcement and registration announcement coming soon, so please keep an eye out um, for that information. Um, you might find it in, um, uh, if you're... You'll be added to our, I'm sorry, you'll be added to our um, kind of contact information. So if you've registered here, um, you'll be notified via email of um, upcoming webinars. And then always we make announcements um, for upcoming webinars on our socials. All right, so let us move on now to the Q&A portion. So we have, some questions coming in. All right. So we have a question, um, one of the first questions that came in, how are case plans, uh, conditions, sanctions, incentives, um, how is that information 
uh, communicated to individuals on supervision. I guess I can answer that. <laughs> um, the communication happens between the probation officer and the individual under supervision. So um, it's, it's just part of the interactions that we have when we uh, meet with with uh, those under under supervision. So they're just discussed during office visits. They're discussed during community visits. Um, the officer lets the person know, you know, you're doing very well, you know, this, you know, as a result of you complying, your curfew is going to get reduced. So that communication happens throughout the supervision period, as well as if there's non-compliance issues that's um, specifically explained um, throughout the process. And what, if there's a graduated sanction, what that sanction is, um, the case plans, the treatment accountability plan, that's what they go over with the officer every time they come in for an office visit. So it's their plan is reviewed with the probation officer on an ongoing basis. Oh, so I think I answered that. <laughs> Thank you very much. Um, so there was a question, uh, Jeff, and it was about um, the slide you cited about the rationale for EPICS training. Um, so um, when we stated that staff are trained in EPICS, staff who are trained in EPICS outperform untrained staff in the use of core correctional practices. Um, so there's a question um, that says, you know, since there are positive outcomes when officers have completed EPICS training, um, are there, um, I guess the question is kind of like, is there research on um, negative outcomes when staff aren't trained in EPICS? So it's, I see that it is a, um, it's a, it's a, we cited, it's a study, um, by Ed Latessa. So I don't know if um, if in that study, if you recall, if there's a discussion on negative outcomes or not. Um, and if you don't recall, we can always um, attempt to um, provide the name of the, the actual study for, for review later. Sure. Um, you know, I don't know that there's really any negative effects per se of people not being trained in EPICS, but really what EPICS is designed to do is improve and enhance the services that we are delivering to the people on probation. Uh, it provides us more options and more structure and uh, some techniques to use for interventions. Um, so that's really what EPICS is about. It's about enhancing what we already do and hopefully improving the outcomes uh, for the people we supervise. So, like I said, um, you know, all the research that, you know, we've looked at in training and that I've uh, viewed really just, it, it kind of shows that EPICS only enhances what people are already doing versus having a negative effect if people aren't trained. And I just wanted to point out, it's a tool in, in an officer's tool belt. So it's 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 just one option officers have. And again, it's for those high risk individuals. That's what the focus of, of EPICS is, is it's, it's for those high risk individuals. So not everybody under supervision falls into that category as well. So there's a, a question, um, let's see. So there's a question and I and I think we get, you know, the, there's questions, I think there are questions that Missy and I think that you'll probably take this one because we get this kind of, I think at, at every um, kind of event and every kind of webinar that we talk about probation and parole rates. So there's questions about um, how probation is addressing um, um, uh, assisting individuals attaining vital documents that they need and um, people who are, are homeless or at risk of being becoming homeless um, while they're on probation. Yes, so not everybody who's under supervision has served time in a level four or five facility. Sometimes they are sentenced right from court. But for those individuals that are sentenced to a period of incarceration, we do have probation officers that are in-reach coordinators. So each 
in-reach coordinator is assigned to an institution, they go into the institutions, they, they do workshops uh, with individuals pre-release, um, they work individually with people who are about to um, be released and get them credential cards so they can get all their vital information. So um, we do work inside of the facilities as probation officers to help with that transition from incarceration to community supervision um, and, and help with like if there's needs that need to be addressed regarding housing, uh, maybe we, we can offer hotel vouchers um, if they need their you know, birth certificate um, and, and social security cards, we, we provide them with those credential cards that assist them once they leave the facility. Um, those in-reach coordinators are also resources for officers. If the situation comes up where they don't fall in that category, they can assist existing officers with helping get that information um, so that they can have what they need to start their lives or, or to get a job, um, secure housing, that sort of thing. Thank you. Um, so there's, then there's another question, I think. Um, well, no, I don't think I know that there's another question. So do individuals on supervision help build their case plans or are they based solely on um, the assessments? I take it this one too. <laughs> um, so it, it's based on the totality. It's based on the R and R. It is based on um, any needs that have been identified through the um, assessment process. Um, it could be something new that that comes up, and um, the plan is an ever changing plan. So maybe there's a need that's not identified initially, but throughout the supervision period, there's a need that needs to be addressed. So it's um, the officer working with the individual to create a plan. It's their plan. Um, so it's based mostly on the r, &R but it's also based on, um, it could be based on the court order programming. Um, it could be based on needs as they, as they evolve. So All right, thank you very much. Um, let's see. So there, there's, there's a question about, um, so the question is, um, how do probation officers handle um, potentially new victims, like a, so a person on probation for a domestic violence charge with a new partner that the PO um, thinks or knows may be in danger. So for example, due to a police call out um, for domestic violence. So um, so I guess the question is kind of how does, how do POs, um, address potential new victims in so, domestic violence cases. I don't know if that, that's probably pretty hard to, probably very yeah. individualized, right? I mean, yeah, so, so officers do do home visits. And so if it's like a no unlawful contact and the, the um, probationer and the victim are still together, the probation officer is visiting the scene of the crime and can engage with that victim um, when they do home visits. But if they're, they have a new partner who could potentially be another victim, um, they can also find out how things are going when they visit them in the community. Um, sometimes family members or uh, significant others call the probation officer to report um, information. Um, so if a new potential victim is reporting something to the probation officer. Um, it depends on what the circumstances are. If there's a new crime that's committed, the officer can talk to that um, new potential victim about filing charges, getting a PFA order. Uh, we do have victim services agents within each county who can also assist. So an officer could refer um, a new potential victim to 
that person who can kind of walk them through the process and um, accompany them to court if they need to. Um, so we can't get into what the supervision activities are uh, because that information is confidential, but you know, the officer can engage a new potential victim, like, do you know what the person is on probation for? Um, and generally, um, they do know if it was they're on for a domestic and they're with a new partner. Um, generally, they they do have some sort of understanding of what they're being supervised for. Great, thank you. So it looks like there's just one more um, so far that I see right now um, question that goes back to um, EPICS. So is there data showing um, an impact on um, uh, reduction in uh, VOPs and uh, recidivism from the use of EPICS? Uh, yes, in other jurisdictions, yes. Uh, in Delaware, um, like I mentioned, we're still in the process of getting everyone trained. Uh, we have we just completed a training class for approximately 30 staff. We have another uh, 80 or 90 in training right now. Um, so we're re really getting ready to turn the page from training to full implementation. And we have some come up with some mechanisms to start tracking uh, that data, and that is something that we want to look at. Um, so as far as Delaware, um, we're not there yet with a dat with data or a study on that, um, but there have been studies in other jurisdictions, specifically in Ohio, where, um, you know, this was developed, um, that individual, high-risk individuals uh, who are supervised by probation officers trained in EPICS uh, do have lower reoffense rates and lower reincarceration -incar rates um, then people not. All right, great. Thank you so much. Okay, so it looks like I think that that is all the questions. So I want to um, thank everyone, of course, for joining us um, and for, um, you know, continually being interested in, in the department and the things that we're doing. Um, and I thank Director Kearney and uh, managers Boykin and Winchester for providing information for us. Um, I'm gonna launch our last poll, um, which again is, um, like I said, anonymous. And this is just kind of an overall rating of the webinar if um, people would like to go ahead and um, weigh in on how satisfied they were with this webinar. Um, just as a reminder, um, we will make the um, recording available on the department's YouTube channel, and you can also view all of our previous webinars um, on the department's YouTube channel. We will send the PowerPoint out, and if you stayed, um, if you stay tuned for the entirety of the webinar, you'll get a certificate of attendance. Um, we do hope that you'll be able to join us um, next time, and. Um, we will uh, hopefully have that date out sooner rather than later for our final webinar in the um, Navigating Probation and Parole series. Um, once again, thanks everyone for, for joining us and for your, for your interest um, in the things that we are, are doing here. We'll follow up um, if anyone had any questions, you know, please feel free to follow up with, um, we have you know, put out some emails, um, contact information in the PowerPoint and um, Look forward to seeing everyone next time. Thank you. Thank you. Are we no longer?